It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to uh, uh, the next lecture in the Chair's Lecture Series. Uh, I have all of my uh, incredibly important notes on, on stickies. Uh, in fact, I've condensed uh, Aaron Bain's entire career to one green sticky. Note. There we go. <coughs> That's all you got. That's all it's worth. It's all he gave you. Uh, but, uh, but again, it really is my pleasure to welcome you here. I'll just say quickly, I can't stay for the lecture today. Uh, some personal issues that I have to take care of. Uh, I've already told the speaker, I just want to apologize to all of you. Uh, but uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, home is Saskatchewan, right? Well, actually, yeah. it's half and half now. Half and half. half, and half now. <laughs> Aaron did his undergrad degree work at the University of Virginia, and then both his master's and PhD at the uh, University of Saskatchewan. Uh, along with some time spent with Environment Canada through the PhD program. Is yep, that correct? That's correct. And then uh, came here, uh, spent uh, way too much time uh, in Stan Putin's lab as a postdoc. <laughs> and then for some reason in 2004, 2005, and he can't remember which one, <laughs> and I didn't look it up, Laura Frost made a mistake and hired him into uh, the faculty complement here in the department. Uh, and I can honestly say we've never looked back. Uh, nothing against any of the other speakers, maybe a bit of pressure for the... Uh, for the younger, uh, newer faculty hires, but taking Dr. Bain to FEC every year is actually one of my, my great pleasure moments and was one of those slam dunk files uh, when it came to making arguments uh, for uh, promotion to full professor. Uh, well, you know, that's all I'll say. I don't want to, I don't want to make them blush up here. But it is a remarkable teaching, uh, research, and service file. Uh, and in particular, uh, probably a glowing example of uh, an unbelievable network of professional service. And really, I do have to mention that publicly, because I don't very often get a chance uh, to say anything about it to you guys uh, in front of you as a collective uh, when it comes to your own personal achievements. So uh, it, it really is a pleasure. As you can see, uh, he likes birds and killing them. Uh, <laughs> And we'll leave it to him to tell you why. I will make a, a quick announcement. The next speaker in the series has changed. Uh, Mike Belosevich, who was supposed to be the April 12th uh, final installment of this year's inauguration of the lecture series, can't do it. Uh, we've got a last second step in from uh, the Associate Dean Research. Uh, so we'll be hearing from Dave Colt. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> Nicely played. <laughs> All right. Thank Good you luck. very much. Yep. Take care. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. So today I'm going to take us on a little bit of a story where we're going to learn a little bit about stats, sampling theory, really bad government policy, and how this all relates to the concept of avian conservation. So the outline for today, the first thing I'm going to do is admit my sins and tell you how many times I'm going to be arrested over my lifetime in terms of the number of birds that I have or will kill. And I'm going to split this into two concepts, direct and indirect. And I'll tell you a little bit about what I mean by those. And what I'm trying to do with my program is understand at very large spatial scales what are the consequences of various human actions on birds in particular, but biodiversity generally. And I'm going to talk about a big project I did with some undergrads here in the department on window collisions. I'm going to talk a lot about my work with forestry and some work on the concept of cumulative effects, which is a big issue here in Alberta. And I'm going to talk a lot about what we do know and what we don't know and the importance of putting that in context when we assess these types of questions because it has very big economic implications. And what I want to do at the end is show you that the way that we spend conservation dollars, when you start to see some of the numbers I'm going to throw around, maybe aren't so wisely used. And as biologists, we maybe need to start pushing for you know, governments and various agencies to start rethinking how they allocate some resources. So what do I mean by direct and indirect effects? This essentially is my research program in terms of understanding what happens to birds. So I have studied the effects of hunting and pest management on birds. I have studied how mortality and competition from pets and invasive species influences birds. Um, the thing I'm going to focus on today a lot is the collision with infrastructure. A lot of birds run into things that we put up in the environment. Collisions with vehicles are an issue. Nest destruction by development and maintenance, the fact that we mow ditches every year, has huge implications for birds. I'm also going to talk about nest destruction by resource extraction, so the oil sands, and how big is that a problem relative to everything else. At the same time, I'm going to talk about indirect effects. 
So habitat loss by conversion of natural habitat to anthropogenic. This is Alberta. That is what we do for a living, is we like to change things that are natural to anthropogenic to get resources out of them. At the same time, a lot of those things don't lead to habitat loss per se, but they lead to habitat degradation by changing the local state. And well, I won't emphasize it today, but climate change is a huge issue in Alberta. Um, we are probably going to undergo one of the largest ecosystem shifts in, on, in the country in terms of what's likely to occur to our forest ecosystems in particular. So what do I mean by direct effects? Well, the government defines this as what's called incidental take. And so what that means is that most birds, most nests, and most eggs in North America are actually protected under a piece of legislation called the Migratory Birds Act. It was established actually originally in about 1915 approximately, but was recreated and reassessed in 1994. The, the reason the act was created is at the time, in 1915, we were hunting, taking feathers, taking eggs, and birds were suffering extensively. And it was recognized by governments at the time they needed to stop that. So they made it illegal to go to a nest, take eggs, go to kill a bird just for its feathers. It had to be a regulated or hunted species to be able to do it. That made huge wins for birds. The premise of this is that at the time, and it was correct at the time, that conserving migratory birds to get the, what we needed to do was protect the individual birds, the nests, and their eggs if we wanted to achieve population maintenance. Now, what that means is that we know um, migratory birds, nests, and eggs can be directly harmed as a result of human activities like clearing vegetation, collisions with infrastructure, all of these things. In 1915, when we wrote the Act, we weren't thinking about those things at all. But this has now been how the Act has been interpreted and applied. In other words, it is illegal to go in and cut down some trees, mow your lawn, mow your crop, and take out a bird's nest. It is illegal to put up a glass structure, much like CSIS, for example, <laughs> and put it in the way of a bird migratory path. But yet, how do we deal with this? The reality is that is all of everything we do as humans. So what exactly we need to do to fix some of those problems is kind of the big question that I'd like to talk about today. Now, as I just kind of said, it is illegal. And up until recently, the government essentially ignored that fact. They did not, there's been virtually no um, companies, no individuals uh, you know, charged under the act, but there have been some exceptions. Very recently, the forestry companies in Ontario were sued for summer logging because that violates the act by destroying nests. There was a building in Toronto that was built right on the migratory pathway, looked a lot like CSIS. It had a bunch of glass on it, and as a result, it was killing hundreds of birds every year. It was deemed illegal, and they actually had to fix it. So the question is, you know, well, how do we do that? Like, there is some things we can fix, but how do we prioritize which things to fix? So, there's the answer to the question. 219. I am going to jail 219 times over the length of the rest of my life. What I want to do for the rest of this talk is show you where I got that number from and what the implications of 219 are when you think about it from your perspective and we accumulate the number of Canadians, the number of North Americans, and the number of people on the planet in terms of our impact. So my direct sins, what are they? Why am I going to jail? Well, there's my number one problem. When I was a kid, I had two cats. They each lived about 15 years. <laughs> And on average, they killed 2.8 birds per year. I have a cat now because my daughter made me get one. I kind of like the cat now, but he doesn't get to go outside, so I'm not going to jail for the rest of it. But the estimate is my cats killed 84 birds over their lifetime, and since I'm responsible for them, that's my problem. Windows. Um, I don't know for sure how many birds I killed prior to owning my own house, but one bird on average, let's say, and we'll come back to that number later, one times 30 years living in my parents' house and basements of apartments and other things like that, 29 is actually what I have killed since I own my own house. Yes, I kept, I kept track. <laughs> I've been keeping track for a very regular, very long time. Now, since then, I've changed my windows. I've done a bunch of things to kind of minimize that impact, but about half a bird probably is still going to die per year at my house on average. So 74 from that. 
I have also kept track over my lifetime how many birds I ran over with my car. It's three so far. The spruce grouse didn't stand a chance. <laughs> Probably three more. My dad gave me a BB gun when I was a kid and said, clean out the house sparrows out of the barn. So I shot six. I told him, Dad, this is stupid. Let them shit where they want. So that's what they do now. <laughs> For research, I did 15. Didn't like it, so don't do that very often. Some of you in this room probably have a higher number. And I ran over a nest once with my lawnmower. And I'm a prof now. I don't time to mow my lawn, so it's going to be zero from now on. <laughs> All right. So that's where those numbers come from. Now, my less direct sins, I use 700 pounds of paper a year. E each of you does, which is about three trees in Boreal, Alberta. So I, you know, there's about 270 to 420 aspen trees per hectare in a mature stand that's being harvested. So over my lifetime, I'm going to take out 235 trees. So somewhere between half to 0.8 of a hectare of trees will be cleared for my paper requirements. I'm a good Albertan. I use mineable oil sands gas and um, about 895 square kilometers have been disturbed in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. That produces 83 million liters of gas a day and I'm going to burn about 135,000 of that for my, in my lifetime. So from a mining perspective, I'm going to take out about 0.012 of a hectare uh, of habitat for birds. In terms of what I eat, it takes about 0.42 hectares of land to feed me on a typical North American omnivore diet. Now, obviously, the land's only cleared once, but agriculture goes through every year. We plant crops, we harvest, we put in pesticides, and there are very good numbers that tell us about you know, how many birds would be disturbed over that lifetime. So the cumulative land over that my 80 years of life is going to be about 32.4 hectares of land is redisturbed every year and might take out some birds. Now, the reality is if I add these up, my paper and my gas, and I look at the density of birds that are in the boreal forest, there's about 5.4 nests per hectare. There's about a 12 to 26 percent chance that the forest is going to be cleared when those birds are nesting. I assume the birds are going to fly away. The adults, I'm going to destroy about 1.2 nests. I'm going to lose about 0.2 birds in terms of recruitment. That is individuals who would have made it to the adult population. Oops. And if I look at my food, I don't really know how many adult birds I'm going to kill because sometimes my combine does run them over. Destroyed nest is about 120, and my lost recruitment is about 30. The point of this is I want to emphasize, you can probably see by these numbers, what I'm responsible for in terms of number of birds killed directly versus, you know, by, by my actions versus, you know, the cumulative effects of the land use that I'm affecting are very, very different. And they influence maybe how we start to think about priorities. So, what should be our main conservation priorities? So, I worked with a series of AV, uh, Environment Canada scientists and other researchers across the country to basically come up with estimates for every single human land use or activity we could think of and see how would we quantify the magnitude of the effect that's occurring. So, my 219 comes from this review and it's become one of the more cited sets of papers that I've worked on in a while. And the basic rationale was the government wanted to assess what was the real major risks. What were the things we should put our money into? And so they made the statement, we want to develop an approach supported by best management practices and avoidance guidelines. The risk-based approach is intended to address the highest threats to the conservation of migratory birds. So my question, is my 219 representative of what's going on in Canada, in Alberta, or at the continental scale? So we're trying to put this in context. And the outcome was as expected, based on what I have done as an individual. If you accumulate that across everyone in Canada, this is basically the take home. This is millions of birds killed annually. Cats wins by far. Approximately 200 million birds are estimated to be killed in Canada every year by household cats and feral cats. Power line collisions are actually quite high at about 25 million. Windows are about 22 million. Vehicles represent about 10. Agriculture is at around five, forestry, and the big old bad oil and gas guys, they don't even register, okay? They're essentially not on the graph. So the reality is this 269 million birds, 2 million nests, 168 million lost breeders, what we've been looking at is, well, where should our priorities be? Where should we invest our conservation dollars? Because what I'm going to talk about a little bit later, we spend a lot of money down here and absolutely nothing up here. So 
What has been really interesting about this process is how much media attention it got. So cats, the number one killer of birds in Canada, this was one of the most cited papers in terms of media awareness that I've ever put out. Raising awareness was huge. So cats, number one killer of birds, people got the message. Now, it's still very difficult to deal with this problem. My friend Pete Mara, he works at the Smithsonian in Washington, recently published a book, and he's been working very hard on this cat issue. He is um, vehement, we need to control cats. And as he and I put it, we'd rather take on the CEO of an oil sands company any day rather than a grandma with a cat. Okay? They are a, a powerful lobby group, especially in California and other places like that. Protection of cats is very high on many people's radar screens. Now one of the things that I was happy about that came out of it is that the window issue that I'm going to talk quite a bit about is actually improving. A lot of the articles that got published identified some of the solutions that people could do and we started to get a lot more people saying, hey, this is something that we can actually fix. And in fact, um, next week I am going to be in Toronto at the Canadian Standards Association trying to help them develop regulations for bird-friendly wi bird windows. So hopefully that will be an improvement. At the same time, it's led to better science. As soon as people put out this idea that the oil sands and mining weren't having a big impact, a lot of people said it's time to reassess the science, and there were debates and you know, criticisms about some of the estimates that we use. So that's good, it engages debate. And it's led to economic discussion. It's led to this idea of comparing risk. Where should we put our dollars? Should we put it into fixing oil spills and worrying about oil spills, or should we fix windmills right, and power lines and that kind of stuff? So there's, you know, it's actually engaged a lot of people in this conversation. Now, comparing risk isn't always a good thing. So as Colleen would know, right, this is the oil sands, this is the place that creates all of the environmental problems in Alberta from many people's perspective. And in this region, we've had huge mortality events, at least a lot of people think of them as huge. So an oil sands company in 2010 was fined $3 million because 1,600 ducks died in one day on one of these tailings ponds. Hundreds more are thought to die every year across the tailing ponds in the region. So this has been an area of research for our department. It's been an area of great controversy for the oil sands. And people view this as, this is a, you know, it's huge evidence that we've got a massive problem with the oil sands. But by giving people, like in the public, you know, some people could argue, yeah, that's a big deal. Others might disagree. But this was the first thing I got after I published my window paper. People put on the bottom of my CBC sites, Windows are killing 2,700 birds a day in Alberta, way bigger problem than the dead ducks in the tailings ponds. Why don't you worry about that, Mr. Biologist? And that was his exact words to me. <laughs> and so I had to sit and think about that. I mean, he's got a very good point. We're talking like orders of magnitude more. So we have to start thinking about, you know, where do we invest money? Now, what the review taught us, there's a lot of interest from the public in this. We have a lot of uncertainty in the estimates. And there's a concern that focusing on incidental take is taking away from issues like habitat loss, fragmentation, and climate change. And I think what came for me was, given we framed the problem this way, how will, should, we actually change our conservation strategy? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we are doing there. Now this is my favorite book, Damned Lies and Statistics. And this gentleman, um, basically argued that bird window strikes and all of the research that had been done on bird window strikes prior to the publication of our paper was a classic example of how dubious data collected using biased or non-representative sampling designs enters policy debates. And he was totally right. And here's why. Oops. The first paper that went into our review was Banks. And he assumed one window collision per square mile in the US, 3.5 square million square miles, so 3.5 million die every year. <coughs> Erickson estimated, with no data that I could ever find, 410 to 820 million birds killed annually in the United States. Clem, who was the most cited person in bird window collision literature, tracked mortalities really well for two full years at two houses <laughs> in a rural environment. And he found that one to 10 collisions were happening with about 97.6 million houses in the US. That leads to 98 to 976 million deaths annually. What I find fascinating and what Best was talking about in his book is that you cannot find that reference anywhere in the public literature anymore. In newspapers, everybody cites this one, mm. right? And it's just, it's people's, they like to react to big numbers, and so the billion became the accepted number. 
Dunn was one of the ones who did a, a, some actually good science on the topic. She found about 9.2% of 5,500 people found dead birds on their winter feeder program. So about 248 million deaths annually. So this was kind of what we had to start to work with in these reviews. And that's why there's great debate. The value of that ranking really depends on the quality of the data. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about now is how we improved that. So the major source of uncertainty in our window of mortality for us was it was driven by one paper that I wrote, right? And so we have to assume that I'm right, and I know I'm not. <laughs> so I, the question is, how wrong am I? So was how we got there good science, and can the results be validated? So we have to talk about how we count dead birds. Did we get a random and representative versus a haphazard sample? Like we're trying to talk about a continent here. Statistical population over we draw inference is important. Oops. And so all of these things were things that I said, well, how am I going to address these? So the first thing I did was I realized I could not collect this data on my own. I have one to two birds hit my house every year. That's going to take a long time before I have statistical power to say anything. So I recruited the students in my conservation biology class to help me get data. So what each student had to do was make a pamphlet. Okay? And the pamphlets, um, it was kind of fun. They had to create them, and then they had to hand them out to the public. They had to go to a certain set of mailboxes on a certain street, put them in the mailbox, and that allowed then us to get in contact with the public to find out what was going on with strategies. We did some couple of fun things. We did one story had to be positive. Hey, you're killing birds, but it's not. It's okay. You can fix it. And you had to have a pretty picture of a bird. The second one was you had to be really mean and negative. We are killing birds, and it's bad. And you had to have a pretty picture. And then we had to have ugly, horrible pictures and happy messages. And then we had to have, this was my personal favorite, we had to have a horrible picture and um, a really bad thing. And this was a good one because it says, Edmonton's bird population is dying to see our windows. Head-on collisions are killing all our urban wildlife. And this is the best part. You fasten your child's seatbelt to protect them from the windshield. The blue jay in your backyard isn't so lucky. <laughs> I got phone calls about that one. <laughs> Anyway, these students did a phenomenal job making these pamphlets. They handed them out. And the question that I had at the time is, is, is this going to work? Or is the public actually going to interact with us? So we handed out 6,400 pamphlets in 2009 in black and white, 1,760 in 2010 in color. And we did this in randomly selected neighborhoods and streets within Edmonton. Oops, I keep pushing the wrong button. We sent out more than 7,000 email requests, Twitter, Facebook. So we don't really know exactly how many people we reached, but almost everybody who responded was from Alberta. And what we found is very few differences between the online and pamphlet houses in terms of the types of residences we sampled. So that was good. We then had the people had to respond. They had to come in and they went to a survey monkey site. And on this survey monkey site, we asked them, has a bird ever hit a window in your current residence? How long have you lived in your residence? Has a bird hit a window in the past year? By the way, how many people? So there we go, we just collected data. Done. <laughs> awesome. And that's actually pretty typical, right? That was about you know, a third to half of you. And that's pretty normal when I ask that question. How many birds do you remember hitting windows in your house in the last winter, spring, summer, fall? And the reason we did this is we wanted to see if people were being consistent in the way that the cumulative totals occurred. And actually, generally, they did. So just asking people what they remembered was actually quite useful. And then we asked a whole bunch of attributes about their house. So we had 1,093 responses with 66% of people completed our whole survey. In 2010, we had 11,031 with 85%. So we went from two houses sampled in Clem to about 2,000, so a little better. And the main reason was we, that we had the difference is we, sam we simplified some questions, and I learned a lot about social science. <laughs> Don't put questions about cats first. <laughs> put them at the end. But what was cool was when we looked at kind of how we got input from people, electronic was way bigger than the pamphlet. We got way more responses that way. Um, the no solutions versus clear solutions, there's no statistically significant difference. It didn't really matter if we told people how they could fix the problem versus not. But if we showed them a live bird picture, they were far more likely to respond than if you showed them a dead one, right? So it's very interesting that how you do this matters quite a bit. Now, the result was, this is what we got. Estimated deaths per year per house. We have the house age in years here. And we have four types. Rural homes with feeders, so think outside Sherwood Park, St. Albert, that kind of stuff. 
rural with no feeder, urban with a feeder, and urban with no feeder. So urban with no feeder was the lowest, but it depended. It got higher as the neighborhood got older and then kind of plateaued. Same thing happened with a feeder, but it was elevated and high, so having feeders seemed to kill more birds. Rural, you get more, and then if you have a feeder in a rural, you're up to around three birds on average are killed per year. So these were the first, I would say, real numbers that anybody had on this topic that were based on a significant sample size. But when you're a biologist and you do social science, you have to deal with the haters. So this was the first journal response from the editor. The basic problem is that it has insufficient scientific rigor for publication in an international journal. By the way, it was a shitty journal, but that's beside the point. <laughs> Further, the data appear to be weak and incomplete. That was the review I got. These are my peers who used this paper in their work since. In the most extensive and best designed building collision study to date per building mortality rates at individual residences were higher. My point of this was, this led me to a place where it's like, look, I've got an estimate, but there's a lot of difference of opinion as to whether this is good science or bad science. And so I felt the need to actually further quantify how well this worked. And it's really interesting when you get stuff in the media, right? So internet comments from CBC News Stories. This study demonstrates very clearly why feeding birds is a problem. Thank you to U of A for this important study. I didn't think bird like bird feeders were the main story, but that's what people got out of it, right? Then this dude, feeding birds is a good thing. This study was done by a bunch of undergrad students, so don't believe it. This is a garbage study. I found out later he actually owns a bird seed company. <laughs> and Trump. No, I'm kidding. Okay. But what I wanted to do was I was struggling, right? I had this data. I thought it was good. I thought it was a good story. But if we're going to put this in and the government's going to accept that windows are such a big cause of this, I felt the need to do it again. So Justine joined my lab and she did a wonderful job of using students and using the pamphlets and doing all of the same things. But the fundamental thing we did different, it wasn't based on did you remember. You had to look around your house every day. And I don't know if anybody here participated, but if you did, thank you very much. We created a website, and every day that you walked around your house, you had to say, did I find evidence of a dead bird? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. We had people, 381 participants participate for at least a year. Some participated even longer than that. And here's the take home. The numbers are different, but they're pretty much the same pattern, right? So here we have apartments, here we have urban with no feeders, here we have urban with feeders. We did have a very big difference between rural uh, no feeders and rural feeders were about the same. But the point is, the actual numbers are approximately the same. They are different. They do make a difference. And so one has to incorporate that uncertainty when one gives the government the estimate of the number of birds that are dying. Now, I also wanted to take on the bird, seeder guy, the bird seed guy. So I did this just to piss him off. <laughs> so I also pissed off animal care, but I won't talk about that. So here we have the percentage of residents that had a certain number of collisions. And here we have people with feeders and no feeders. We manipulated the feeders. So we made them watch every day. We put the feeder in, we'd take it out. We'd leave it in for about 30 days, take it out. So we actually had the same houses controlling over time and all kinds of other stuff. And the basic premise was that yes, we had slightly higher collisions in winter, spring, summer, and fall when you had a feeder. So feeders do kill birds, right? And so this people don't like. Grandmas really don't like this because they love their birds. But it actually got across some very important messages, like you can draw birds to your yard, and that's a good thing, but how you position that feeder and where you put it and all that kind of stuff actually matters. So we've been able to influence a lot how people are thinking about that. They don't put it in the wrong place. They're putting it in a better place that reduces that collision rate. Now, a couple other things we actually included as well. This was a fun project by the undergrads. Um, they looked at what was taking the carcasses, because people were searching once a day, but it's possible that birds were hitting the windows and dying, right? And, but, and a predator or a scavenger came and took it away. So what the students found is about 32% of the carcasses were removed within 24 hours. So that meant we were missing some, so we had to adjust that. But this was really important because in cities, the carcass removal rate's about 1.47, whereas in the reviews that people had used, they were using numbers as high as 2.3 and 5, and that was based on wind farm studies. So it improved our estimate considerably. So, what did that actually mean? So there's about 1,400 residences in Alberta. About 0.69 birds are killed per residence per year after you adjust for detection bias, 
number of feeders, urban houses. That's the range. So about 957,440 birds, approximately, um, die every year. It's somewhere between 800,000 and 1.2 million. And we did that by randomly sampling all of these different parameters that we had from these different studies and seeing what happened when you picked one parameter estimate versus another, and these are what the combinations look like. Now this is what the Alberta distribution looks like. This is the most likely estimate, and these are all plausible estimates based on that data. Now I did not want to extrapolate this to Canada because this is Alberta, right? This is where most of our data came from. But if we take that, we're looking at about 22 million birds are being killed by windows every year. We weren't that far off in the first paper in the first place. So I did a lot of work to prove that my number wasn't bad. <laughs> But I think it was useful because it's now reinforced that this is a pretty high priority. There's still a big unknown though. This is the number of birds that people report dead. This is the number of things they think collided. So they heard a thud, they saw a mark on the window, they saw some feathers or blood. So we're assuming that these ones die and these ones live. But if 5.5 die after flying away from the window, the number goes from 10 million? 200, right, in an instant. And this is going to be one of the great challenges. We don't know how to fix this. We can't measure this phenomena. It's very difficult. All right, so let's zoom back to forestry. So here's forestry. Poor, lowly forestry. Down here, doesn't kill enough birds, needs to kill more. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but this is the perception. Forestry is this bad boy on the block. That's where we should put our money. That's where we should worry about making sure they don't log in the summertime. Well, the question is, is that number right? Right? And it's also really important because Understanding forestry's effect really influences our understanding of does this matter? Because to understand does this matter, you have to know how many birds there are. And we don't really have a good handle on that. So what influences uncertainty in nest loss? So again, the premise of this, in the summertime, there's some logging. Okay? When that logging happens, there are nests in the trees and in the shrubs and on the ground, and the feller buncher runs them over or cuts the tree down, and the nest falls out and doesn't make it. Right? So that's the premise. That's illegal. But the question is, do all nests fail when disturbed? I'm not going to talk about that today. Does renesting compensate? Birds do renest, they just move, so that can happen. Um, does a singing male equal a nest? And this talks about how we estimate numbers. Is the loss additive or compensatory? Would these guys have died anyway? These are all questions we're working on to try and refine things, but um, we're a long ways away from having these answers. But we are working really hard in understanding, well, how many birds are there? in Alberta, in Canada, etc. And so, in other words, how many nests are there? And I want to talk a little bit about, and this puts the economics in perspective, is what industry doing to mitigate these effects effective? And this is this dollars and cents type of argument I want to talk about. So what this shows is, this is the area harvested in hectares on provincial crown land and private land every year. Okay, so we're talking about a million hectares in Canada every year. Sometimes it goes down to as little as 650,000 and fluctuates. But we are taking out a lot of trees every year for forestry. Now they do grow back, but some proportion of those are being cut in the summertime and that has an influence. So there's about 600,000 to a million hectares. We, we didn't know exactly what proportion is being harvested in the summer. The estimates are anywhere from 12 to 26%. We multiplied that by the nest densities, and I want to emphasize that's how different nest densities are across Canada. They range from about half to 12.2 nests per hectare. So you have to actually work pretty hard to understand what those numbers are. And what that led us to is, well, 660,000 to about 2 million birds are being lost due to forestry. So the question is, how good are these numbers? So we also had to look at the question of, well, what about the nests that were lost in terms of recruits, the number of the fly, to the fall population? So we also included things like clutch size, nest success, probability of young data independence, juvenile or of survival. We made the most complex model you've ever seen in your entire life. It didn't change things much relative to what we thought when we just said, you know, six, um, like how many nests are getting run over. So this is what that looks like when you take all those various uncertainties and you take all those parameters and you throw them into a simulation, you start to see that, you know, we're talking about a million birds instead of 22 million from windows. But, and this is what's important and what I'm spending a lot of time on right now, of all that uncertainty, what matters the most? How you estimate how many birds there are. Because this is what's going to influence the other part of my question, does it matter, right? 22 million. Is that a lot? It depends. 
If there's billions, maybe not. If there's only millions of birds, then probably. So right now, this is our best way of estimating the number of birds in North America, or Canada, I guess, specifically. This is North American Breeding Bird Survey. What these are are road-based routes where a volunteer goes out for one day in June, drives along, and every three minutes stops and records the number of birds that they hear. We've used these kind of numbers to estimate the number of birds that you get. Now, you can obviously see we don't know much about here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here, in these huge areas of, North, of Canada. And as a result, the estimate, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in it. Now, the other uncertainty things are, is one male equal two individuals? That's a big question. How do you correct for time of day? So birds sing at dawn. If you ever want to come out and work with me, you've got to get up at 3 in the morning, so get ready. Um, the time adjustment, how you correct for that. Like if a survey is done at 10 in the morning, it's not equivalent to one at 5 in the morning. So you have to fix that. And how you fix it, how much does that matter? How far you can hear a bird influences density. So if a bird's really far away, um, we need to know how far away if we want to know how many birds per unit area. And that's actually really quite hard to measure. And doing everything on roads creates a problem because roads are biased. And all of the BBS routes are biased. They're, at, they're sampling mostly agricultural land and a whole bunch of things that we don't really want to understand. We need to understand a lot more about forests. So Tog, Thog Martin criticized all of these things, and I'm not going to go through them in detail. But he basically said, yeah, those, all of the, everything that BBS estimate, it sucks. It's so bad that we really shouldn't be using it to actually estimate the size of the populations of birds in Canada. So he said, what you need to do is come up with way better statistical methods, way better sampling data, way better everything. So what we did is we went and asked all of our colleagues, every environmental agency we could come up with, every um, environmental impact assessment, and we got all of their point count data from off-road. Right? So we collected everybody's. There's about 200,000 locations now in this map, so we have much better spatial distribution. And now we're able to actually better estimate the number of birds that are coming out because we have the capability to correct a lot of the problems with the BBS. So Peter Solomos, who's a research associate with me, has helped me do a lot of this. So we've come up with a better time adjustment method. We've come up with a much better way of estimating distance. We've come up with roadside count corrections so that we're not dealing with this bias anymore. And we've included habitat in these different models. Now what we find is that the road effect for some species is huge and for others it's positive and some species, species it's negative, but on average across species there's no bias. The time of day effect and how you fix it, again some species it's strongly influenced, others so, not so much, but across species it's not really biased. It's this distance effect, how we estimate distance, that matters the most. So the way BBS does it, they just use a set distance and they say that's how many birds are within that distance, so that's the density, and it's just wrong. It's very wrong. Exactly how wrong is the big question. So here's how bad we are at figuring out how many birds there are. So in terms of answering the question, does it matter, for alder clive catcher, if we use the BBS PIF approach, about the same as ours, good. If we use American robin, nah, not so bad. By the way, these are in millions, so that's 4.5 million versus 2.5 million. Canada warbler, which is an endangered species that everybody's worried about, well, we're an order of magnitude off, so that's not so good. And yellow rump warbler, which is one of the most common species in the boreal, according to um, the BBS, there's 2.5 million of them in Canada. We think there's 30 million. So we don't really know the answer to this question of how many birds are there. We think we're on the high side. We think they're very much on the low side, and it's probably somewhere in between. Now, does it matter? Legally, no. Because destroying even a single nest by summer harvesting is illegal. So forestry companies, basically, if you cut a tree down, you're going to break the law. Practically, it does. Because what we're working with the forestry companies right now is to say, look, if you're going to log in the summer, let's go to places with lower nest density and less risk of an endangered species. And let's set some priorities that allow us to maybe make a slight difference that's actually useful. But it does matter a lot because if there's 1 million versus 1 billion birds, right, my 22 million birds getting killed by windows, its perspective changes. So here I want to get into money for just a little bit. This is more of a rant than anything else. Industry's solution to this problem, they can't stop. And here's why they can't stop. Stan is a pain in the ass. Between January to July, you are not allowed to do anything in Caribou Zone. 
So that's the government solution. Stay out of that habitat because you're going to disturb caribou. And then Andy and Mark are pains in the asses because the bears, January, you're not allowed to do anything up until April, and then November, December because they're dennings. Please stay away from there. The fisher, okay, we don't have anybody who studies fisher here as far as I know. Cindy, she's a pain because they're denning the amphibians again, so you're allowed to maybe operate in August, September, October. And here's the migratory birds. So, forestry, oil and gas, and every other activity is allowed to operate in September. That's it. <laughs> so we have to do everything in September. So the reality is companies will not do this. It's almost become useless, these timing constraints and guidelines. So what companies are doing instead is if they're going to go in during the migratory bird season and clear some land, they do a nest search. So they go looking for the nests. Then they set up like things and say, here's a nest here. Let's cut around it. Now, I don't have a good picture of this, but quite often this leads to four trees and five feet of grass with everything else clear around it and the nest is in the middle. Okay? And we spend huge amounts of money doing this. And the question is, is it at all useful? So the current guidelines that the provinces are recommending if you're going to do this is you're going to have to spend three days per site with two hours per hectare to locate the nests. That's what they recommend. It costs about $1,000 to $1,800 a day to do that. And most people think you find between 10 to 80% of the nests. So if you figure out 80%, that's not bad. Maybe that's a reasonable way of dealing with it. If it's 10%, that's pretty much useless. So let's take that rationale. Let's say it's 10%. And so we're really having no benefit to the birds by looking for these nests. Because we, we don't find all of them. We know we don't. But if we only find 10%, we're not really having a positive benefit. But these guys could be spending upwards of 108 to 312 million a year. They don't, but they could be if they were forced into this as compliance. Now, let's take that and put that. Using a high-end window film, this is the most expensive window film you can buy. It costs about 300 bucks to retrofit my house. That will have about a 90% success rate at reducing bird collisions. There are about 10 million houses in Canada, so it's going to take about 3 billion. All right, so that sounds like a lot. But if forestry, energy, urban development, highways, bridge builders put into a damage fund, in 10 to 20 years, we could have every house in Canada fixed right, from a bird window collision perspective. And these guys would be paying in as a penalty for the fact that they're destroying nests during this breeding season. So the point is, 22 billion birds a year could be saved by using a damage fund to fix window issues, whereas the best that forestry is ever going to do is probably 800,000 nests or birds that are saved for the same amount of money. So this is what I've been trying to work on quite a bit with forestry companies and the government, is trying to reassess our priorities based on this kind of cost-benefit analysis. I already said that. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, is killing birds a problem? I gotta hurry up here. Um, so, it's the billion or at least million dollar question. So, how many birds are there breeding? What's the size of the fall flight? And what happens in Alberta, the limiting factor? So, I'm gonna use Alberta as an example now. So, how many birds are there? This is, you know, I showed you there's a lot of uncertainty, but in here in Alberta, we've actually been able to do a much better job of figuring this out. So, I work a lot with the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. And we've been able to create um, predictions for the entire province for almost every bird species in terms of how many there actually are. How we do this is we create bird habitat models, like a lot of people would talk about. And what we look at is this is the current footprint on the landscape. We do our bird counts at these areas, and we create relationships between the amount of habitat, the amount of seismic lines, the amount of well pads, the amount of cut blocks, and figure out how the birds react based on habitat. So we predict the size of the population. What we also do, though, is we actually have been creating maps that fix all the human footprint. They get rid of it. And we try to figure out what would the world have looked like if Albertans forgot to show up and didn't develop the landscape. And that allows us to predict sort of how many we've lost and from what activities. And what we're doing right now is looking at these transition maps that show us how much the different sectors are influencing birds in terms of how many deciduous forests are going to agriculture, how many deciduous forests are being turned into cut blocks, transportation, et cetera. So we're able to now, based on habitat associations and densities of birds, project how many birds are being lost from any given activity. And this is just to show um, kind of changes in human footprint over time and what that might mean for birds. As of 2017, about 27% of Alberta has been converted to an alternative human land use, and those trajectories are going up. 
So the question is again, how much does this matter to birds? Now, because we put all this data together, we now have incredibly robust models um, that are based on you know, everybody's data. So we're not just using a single study, but we're using you know, hundreds and hundreds of studies to put together, to put all the data together to get much better estimates of how birds react to spruce type, pine, deciduous. All of this reflects age class. And so we have very complex models in Alberta that show us how birds are associated with just about every habitat and land use condition in the province. And what we're now doing is starting to show, well, how much can we attribute the various sources of loss to the different sectors? So this is Canada warbler. Right now we estimate there's about 800,000 of them. Oh, sorry, there would have been 800,000 of them in the province if human land use hadn't come about. Currently, based on human land use, we think there's about 600,000, so we've lost about 200,000 Canada warbler units in terms of habitat. Agriculture has a big effect on them, but it's not the biggest land player because Agriculture is not so common in the boreal. Forestry is a much bigger impact. And then here we have energy and a variety of other things. So when we look at this, habitat loss and all that kind of stuff, we also start to get a better idea of the magnitude of the long-term loss. These are some maps just showing what we think Canada warblers would have looked like historically. And this is probably what they look like now in terms of their abundance. Red being there's more, blue being there's less. But this is what's really important. People always ask me, this is my, what do you do for a living, Aaron? I study birds. Oh, how are the birds doing? And then I go, well, the birds are doing fine. The Canada warblers, not so good. American crows, they're doing awesome. Because the reference American crow population is about 1.3. Based on our land use, it's about 1.7 million we now have because they like our human land uses. So they've increased. And so we get these increases of some species and these decreases in others. So here's just a map showing that with the crow. And what this summarizes is for every single sector that we have in the province, all disturbances, agriculture, transportation, forestry, energy, urban, this reflects the number of species. So the ones on this side are what we call the decliners. Okay, these are species that decrease with human land use, and these are the ones that increase. Nature abhors a vacuum. We all know that in this room. But for every bird that declines, there's probably one that increases in a lot of cases. So in terms of this indirect effect, so I'm not responsible for all this land use, but I do have a part in it, and so do you. So what we estimate in Alberta, where 22 million birds, or sorry, 10 million birds die from windows collisions every year, there's probably about 250 million birds, approximately, that if humans hadn't been around. Now this is a number that surprises people. With what humans are around, there's probably about 240 million birds. We got Canada warblers dramatically declining, but at the same time, we've got American crows going up, we got pigeons going up, we got robins going up, we got house sparrows going up. And so for every species that's decreasing, we often have one that increases. So that the changes in birds from everything that we've done isn't probably that large. It's about 16 million. There's 4 million people in Alberta, so I'm responsible for four. You guys each are also responsible for four. All right. So again, puts it in context. Land use and birds is a very different question when you start to talk about all birds. Now obviously, if we change that around and we say, well, Canada warblers are what we're going to worry about, then we have a completely different story versus if we have house sparrows, right? House sparrows go up, Canada warblers go down. And this map is showing sort of on average across all bird species, what does the world look like? Green is good, red is bad. And so it shows the areas where we've had the most massive change on average across all the species. And what this indicates, though, is like population isn't such a good metric. It's really the community composition that we have to worry about if we're going to focus on that. All right. So has Aaron completely lost his mind and is absolutely estimating these numbers of fools Aaron? I don't think so. But one of the things that is, I've always loved is when more birds died from something than could have existed. That seems like there's some failure in logic there. So I really want people to worry about that. And that's something I've been pushing you know, in our estimation of this approach. But I think about 5% of the annual breeding population of birds in Alberta dies every year from human-related causes. And it's time to start thinking about what way we prioritize that. Is fixing the oil sands tailings ponds where we really want to invest all of our effort relative to, say, windows or power lines or stuff like that? We need to work a lot more on linking this to migration and other areas of the wintering grounds. We're doing a lot of that right now, but most of these species only spend like four months here, and they spend eight months somewhere else. So those issues are big. And what we really need to do is make sure that 
we kind of prioritize these properly and make sure that you know, we're setting the, the risk assessment correctly because it, it does have big economic implications. I also want to admit my numbers are wrong. They're not 100% right, but they're not bad. But we need to start talking about how much the losers can afford to lose. And this is a big one. Canada warblers in Alberta, by our estimation, there might be 650,000 of them. Even if we've lost 25% of them, big deal. But if it's 85,000 is the actual number, and we've lost 25% of them, that is a big deal. And so this is where I'm really pushing relative abundance studies suck. Stop doing them. Try to actually get density. And we have to be worried about um, you know, which species we're focused on. Because you know, emphasizing cats and windows might actually give us an unintended consequence if that's all we worry about. Because some of those birds might be better adapted to living with us anyway. So I want to end with a hyperbole. Anybody know what that number is? It's the number of people alive at the start of this talk. That's how many people are alive now, at the end of this talk. And if they all kill birds the way that I did, that's how many more birds will die because of the people added in the last 45 minutes. I will stop there <laughs> and thank a whole schwack of people and funders and people and people. Thank you. Uh, Mike, Mike had to go, so since I'm on deck for the next one, uh, thanks for setting a really high bar. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. That, that was fascinating. We, we have some time to uh, take a few questions. I, I knew. You knew there'd be some cat yes. slash bird question. Cat slash. Yeah. Okay, I'll go with a bird question okay. first. Uh, when you had the householders assess through the walkabout and yep. check for dead birds, did they also bag the bird and have the bird ID'd, or was it just a bird? Yeah, so in the first study where we asked people, um, you know, what hit, we asked if they could identify it, and people are pretty bad. <laughs> um, we had, fl no, we didn't ever have flamingo, but <laughs> we did have species that couldn't exist in the province or couldn't exist in Edmonton, for example. But, you know, it was often sparrow, right, or warbler, right. although many times warblers were sparrows. Mm -hmm. So on the new website, we either had them collect them, and then they went to the museum, so we do know what it was. Or we actually had a photo upload, so we actually had a picture of the dead bird as well. So, plus we also have pictures of the evidence on the windows and all that other stuff, so we actually can quantify quite a bit of it through an external process of did the person do it right. And then, so are they the typical urban increasers that tend to smash Yeah, the so um, in general, uh, it goes like this. It's kind of, house sparrows are definitely up there. Chipping sparrows are quite high. American robins are high. Black cat chickadees don't, they hit windows a lot, they don't die as much, right? And the reason is they fly, they fly slower, <laughs> right? So they're a little brighter. But we had everything. We had grouse, mallards, Canada warblers, uh, cedar, uh, bohemian waxwings, you know, so it is, it is the magnitude. And I mean, you know, there was a couple people in the study who, you know, I know personally that live on the River Valley, and I mean, they were killing everything that you could possibly think of at their house. So. Second part, cat. Cats may be the best estimators because they don't leave things out to be eaten by corvids. They take the thing home and give them to mom yeah. so that you can actually count them. So <laughs> that might be the, the, the strongest and best estimate in all the other window count things, right. as you suggest. Extremely, Extremely less certain. Yeah, and I mean, the cat data, it is, the, so the cat paper, um, it's based on a lot of different studies, putting them all together and everything like that. And we were uber conservative in the way that we estimated it. And so like when somebody says a billion for North America, we really don't think that that's far, that's that far off. Because it's not just household cats. Well, the There's cats huge feral cat problems, problem, especially in the United States. Yeah. It's way less of an issue. Like in Edmonton, I don't think we probably have near as much a cat problem because the coyotes killed the cats, so it's all good. <laughs> Go coyotes. <laughs> If human activities are allowing crows and some species like that to increase, and the mm -hmm. crows probably compete with the prettier, nicer, more pleasant I birds, love crows, but okay. Does, does that mean that we're indirectly responsible for those birds' loss because we're... In terms of that quanti course. yeah, in terms of that quantification, I don't think anybody's taken that legally, literally yet. Um, but I mean, I think we could make arguments that, you know, when we make a complementary situation for a species that it can increase dramatically, you know, that and it has negative consequences and spillover effects. I mean, we do it right now. A great example is great horned owls. 
Great horned owls are the number one predator of just about everything in southern Alberta. Sage grouse, which is an endangered species. They take out my frugianus hawks, which are twice as big as the owl, but the owl still eats them, and goes on and on and on. And they are doing so well because of old barns, right? So it's our fault that the great horned owl is doing so well. We created wonderful nesting habitat for it, and it's doing extremely well with a consequence to lots of other species. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, regarding uh, feeders, yes. um, the data on the rural aspect was quite high in relatives. Yep. Think, so how do you handle questions if you get someone in the rural comes up, well, yeah, but way more birds die of the winter because they go hungry and, you know, and I put a feeder in and, yeah, some die, but right. no, still save more. Absolutely. And, I mean, so that is actually one of my biggest challenges is when I was telling that story. And I mean, it's what it's funny, not funny, it's kind of depressing, but in the paper we talk a lot about, um, you know, feeders increase the number of birds in your yard. If you have more birds in your yard, greater probability of hitting window. Okay, that's a no-brainer. But if you position the feeder in the right way and put it on an angle so the birds aren't flying straight at it and all this other stuff, you can actually reduce that. And we actually showed that with part of our study and some other studies. And so that was what we emphasized. But the media didn't read that at all. Feeders are bad, 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 bad. And that's all that people got. So I got yelled at by old ladies. I got yelled at by just about anything we could think of happened. Are the feeders concert. that you stick to your window really bad? No, actually, the feeders that stick to your windows, um, the main, there's a couple reasons. Like Birds actually are pretty perceptive of glass, but they panic sometimes. When a cat comes out or a dog or a squirrel runs by, they panic and they might fly. So that's one of the problems. But when they're actually on the window, the evidence is even though they might, they might hit the window, they haven't picked up enough speed to really hurt themselves. The worst place is the place we all like to put them, which is about where Jan is, because that's the prettiest place to look out your window on a straight line, whereas Rich further back or even a little bit further back wouldn't be so bad because it's not a straight line to the window. So the distance does matter too. Colleen? Aaron, I really appreciated your contrasting of those urban exploiters and the urban avoiders and how it, you can't really just count the birds. Right. But I would like to know how you think that principle would work into this policy suggestion you're making, that there should be an offset, you know, a little like mm -hmm. for fisheries, right. for industry that might like, buy window film or pay for the window film. How would you make that species composition correction? Given well, yeah, yeah. And, that, and I mean, it, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to answer from the perspective, legally is where I guess where I go. There's no legislation that says it's worse to kill that one versus that one. They're all equal, right? Every bird is equal in the legislation. So from that perspective, getting the, you know, convincing the government in its current wording that that would be the way it is is very difficult to, sh to shift. I mean, I do think what's happening more so that will happen um, you know, with companies having to offset and things like that, it is going to be based more on the habitat that they disturb and the habitat they lose and the species that are in that. And that might be, you know, the amount they have to compensate might be dependent on the risk to that species, like a Canada warbler, if you're destroying a bunch of its habitat, that might be a greater cost than if you're only taking out chipping sparrow habitat, for example. So I don't have a perfect answer for that in terms of, you know, what the dollar amount would be or anything like that and whether you would weight one. And we're still working on, you know, kind of some of these discussions on the policy statement about what it would look like. But well, there's a variety of us... so much the dollar amount, mm -hmm. the fact that those industries are occurring Areas, areas that still have wild spaces, they're right. destroying wild spaces, and the compensation you're proposing necessarily occurs in urban spaces. No, well that's but fair enough. Yeah, it is, areas. absolutely. But my point is, they're going to cut the trees down. They're going to make the mine. And if us spending, like I'm not asking them to compensate by fixing, you know, like put, you know, necessarily putting in a new wetland or building new habitat. They could do that, that's an option. But I'm simply saying, if you're going to put money into something as stupid as going to look for the nest and protect it for five minutes while you do some activity, and you're going to spend that money, stop spending it, put it in this pool, and just be good social license and say, hey, I fixed a real problem rather than something I can't fix. That's my argument, more so than, you know, I'm one for one or it's that species with this species. That's my argument. It's just dumb use of money is what I don't like. Let's take one more. So cats are acolytes of Satan, but <laughs> if they weren't killing, right. wouldn't something else be killing? I mean, you know, more weasels, more foxes, more something. I mean, yeah. is, it, is, it, is it just that we've replaced 
what would be considered a, a, you know, a more primitive, very yeah. Toyota of predators with cats? Um, and the answer to that, I mean, I think conventional wisdom would be no. We have increased the density of the cat such that it's so much higher in the environments in which this killing is occurring that there's no other predator that would be able to do it because we, you know, we, we really are the ones that feed them, right? We're providing them food resource. Like natural population dynamics, the coyotes would die because there's no food left. You know, but if we fed the coyotes, there'd be a lot more coyotes than there are now, right? And so I think one of the arguments is that the cats, on average, have way surpassed any kind of predator biomass that would exist in these environments to make that. Um, but, and here's the but, one of the things, there is a couple of cities where they've really hammered down on cats and cat control and making cats stay inside and like it's re like they will charge you a high penalty and are actually in, are actually making people pay them. Edmonton is not one of those. Calgary is a little bit more like that, but Prince George, BC actually has one of the highest penalty rates. And the problem they're having now is small mammals are going and everybody, nobody likes that, right? Because they're getting into garages and houses and stuff like that. So there's a lot of controversy between the controlling of the cat because the cat plays that function for some of the things that we like. But so. what's happened to the birds in Prince George? Well, that's a good question. I don't know is the answer, but yeah. Cynic. Well, small mammals are going to go after their eggs. So, the, is that yeah. killing a bird, by the way, having a predator take the eggs? Um, worse, yeah, well, the pre I mean, that is the way most of, like 50% of nests in the boreal forest and in the Aspen Parkland are destroyed by predators every year. That's, that's the rate. So about half of them die from a predator right before they're even hatched. But that's the point. Is this additive, like we're just adding on an additional 10% or 5% or whatever the number is, or is it compensatory like they would have died anyway and don't worry about it. And the evidence for that is all over the map so we don't really have a good answer. We know in ducks that hunting can be additive in some situations but it also can be compensatory in others and it depends on the environmental conditions of the year. So. All right. Four o'clock. Sure. Thank you very much Aaron. Thank you. Thank you.